So good evening. Uh, welcome to the age of high tech and uh, seamless, seamless working together. My name is Marlin. Uh, good to be here. I will speak English since a few of you um, are English natives and I will talk a little bit about why work is changing and why that is a big deal and uh, why that leads to all sort of changes in organizations. Um, my name is Marlin. Uh, I'm based in Heidelberg, Germany. I've spent 15 years in a corporate uh, setting, mainly in HR, was human resource director, uh, started at European's largest software company, spent some time in building and uh, finance, and uh, finally in pharma for five years, was responsible for about 4,000 people, and now been in consulting uh, for the last year and a half, and help organizations and individuals change how they think and uh, work within organizations. So it's quite a, quite a topic that's dear to my heart. Um, my company is called Lumen, uh, together with a few friends, and uh, basically we see that a lot of uh, world is really, really busy and lacking momentum, and we're trying to inject a little bit momentum and change uh, that is necessary. At the bottom you see a quote from Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, um, who came up with this uh, concept of these three C's, concepts, culture, and capability. And when he started at uh, Microsoft as CEO, he basically said, we need to change our concepts, our business strategy, the way we work with partners and, and the way we approach it. But the most important thing is changing the culture in order that you can change the direction of the business. And then you need the capabilities to execute that. So that's what we focus on, changing this triangle and helping companies do that. We, can, we consider ourselves craftsmen in consulting, meaning that's what we do all day long. And hopefully, we we get better at it each time and uh, are able to help companies along. So, where do we find ourselves today? I love curves. This is one of my favorite curves. This is called the Teller Curve uh, from the guy who actually leads Google uh, X or the Moonshot uh, projects, as they call in Google, uh, Astro Teller. And he uh, had this curve that I uh, uh, ran across in a book uh, by Thomas Friedman. He's a New York uh, Times reporter and talks about how our times are changing. A couple of years ago, he wrote a book called The World is Flat, how the markets move together more closely. That, that, that uh, became really well known. And uh, recently, he uh, brought out a book uh, which was called Thank You for Being Late. And he basically said, we're living in an age of acceleration. The world gets faster and faster by three forces. And this curve explains uh, the nature of these forces. You have on the one side human adaptability, so the capability of humans to learn and to develop uh, new skills, understandings, and ways of doing things. And then you have technological progress. And technological progress is exponential and increasing in power and uh, what it can do in the world. And humans are not as exponential as uh, technology is. So uh, we, for a couple of years now, we have crossed the line where techno technology develops faster than humans, organization, society are able to absorb it. So we have all kinds of questions that technology posed to us uh, that we can't really answer, from data protection to, to morals and ethics. A uh, question, how do we deal with AI once it becomes significantly smarter than we are as humans? How, do, how would we rein this in? So it's a growing gap. And uh, Thomas Friedman uh, puts up three forces that drive this age of acceleration, uh, which are here on the right. Moore's Law, uh, which is based on an engineer uh, from the 1960s, Gordon Moore from Intel, who proposed that the uh, power of a microchip would double every two years. And he did that in 1960. And it's more than intact today. It was even faster than 24 months going forward. So it was an exponential change uh, that has happened in computing power. Also, the markets are moving exponentially. And um, adding to that, and then Mother Earth is also changing, as some of you might have uh, known or is often talked about at the moment. It's coming to a critical phase. If we go to that a little deeper, um, Moore's Law, if you track it from the 1970s onwards, even to 2010, there's a clear line. This is an exponential grid at the side. So there's a, there's a straight line that these things power. So whatever we have in our pockets in two years will be double as powerful. In four years, it will be four times as powerful, and in six years, it will be eight times as powerful. 
That means within our lifetime, within 10 such segments, it will be a thousand times as powerful as it is today. So um, we see significant change just by the raw computing power in these devices. If you're into laws, there's a few other laws next to Moore's law, which addresses processing power. There's Butter's law, which uh, says transmission data information that's being transmitted doubles every nine months. Um, Crider's law, data storage doubles about every 13 months. And Wright's law, meaning production volume cost. Uh, there's a relation between cost and, and production volume. So anytime production volume doubles, there's a cost drop of 15%. So new technologies, if they double, they will get significantly cheaper. Older technologies will, will take much longer uh, for, for the price to drop. So cars, the normal in, uh, ICE, in, uh, internal combustion engine, uh, will be a long time before there's a significant price, price drop. But electric vehicles, since they're still doubling and it's still a relatively new technology, will su see significant price drops. That means there's an enormous force in play here and um, you know within our lifetime there will be even now significant changes if you look 10 years in the future um, these things will be all the more pervasive on the right side you see one illustration of the market dynamics this is a graphic showing how long it took a technology to reach 50 million users starting from the airline it took 64 years the automobiles took 62 years and so on going down to computers taking 14 years the internet taking 77 years to WeChat taking one year, to Pokemon Go taking 19 days to reach 50 million users. That basically highlights how connected our markets are by technology, by uh, interaction. That means whatever we do for data protection around here um, is only part of the piece. There could be people in China, could, could be people in California inventing stuff, and within a couple of days it can take over markets and influence the way we behave and so forth. Right, so we're connected in a way that's never been done before. Mother Earth, all of you know that population growth, um, uh, deforestation is going up, um, urbanization is going up, and resource uh, usage is going up. Um, it's predicted that the world population will reach 9.5 billion within the next uh, two decades. Um, and with that population growth, people are connected to a market and they see Western living standards. A lot of this population growth happens in Africa and, and other places. Um, about a year and a half ago, I was in Papua New Guinea in the highlands uh, of one of the most undeveloped countries in the world. And there were two global brand, brands present in Mount Hagen, which is um, about a mile high. There was Coke, which is everywhere in the world, and there was Vodafone. And everybody in, in uh, Papua New Guinea had a, had a mobile phone and everybody was on Facebook. So everybody's connected. And there's only two, uh, if young people grow up there, they, have, they see Western standards, they see where they live. And there's only basically two ways they deal with it. For one, they say, we want to have a more comfortable life, either import the living standard or they will emigrate and try to study in Australia and other places that are close by in order to have a better life. If you project the growth of uh, living standards to the growth of population, um, the planet uh, basically will have 80 billion inhabitants if it's at the halfway point between Western standards and the lower standards. So all that says is we're living in hot times. Somebody recently said the spaceship is on fire and uh, there's no exit. So climate change, all those things affect us. So the age of acceleration also means that we all live in a time where we feel that. And if uh, exponential, exponential growth usually uh, is very uncomfortable to us as humans. We notice it in two circumstances. One is while we're driving, somebody pressing the pedal really fast and accelerating or, or braking rapidly or in an in a airplane or in a, in a roller coaster, right? And those sort of feelings on our body are not the most comfortable. So age of acceleration is where we live at the moment, and there's no sign that these dynamics will slow down. That's also why organizations uh, face a question, how do we deal in this uh, circumstances? And work shifts these days uh, rapidly um, through these uh, phases. If you look at the left, 
Uh, this is Frederick Taylor, and he published a book in 1911 on the eve of World War I. He, he talked about the, the principles of scientific management, and he was one of the first management consultants. And his big idea was if you break down work into individual pieces, then we can optimize those pieces, become much more effective, uh, get rid of defects because people really are standard, uh, processes are standardized and we work in these. And um, that helps us to become much more resource efficient, work efficient, and we have much more output. And that is truly the case. In 1850, um, which is not that long ago, the average American woman Uh, walked about 150 miles per year, that's 220 kilometers per year, and she carried 36 tons of water just to supply water to her family in America, one of the richest countries at the moment. That's less than 200 years ago. There was um, a lot of the world was in extreme, uh, what we would call today poverty. And People like Frederick Taylor, together with innovations, helped to make use of the resources and the intellectual capital we have around. Ford Motor Company was one of the first ones to uh, uh, jump on that and say, standardized car production, we, this is the way we make it accessible to everybody. And so large corporations are masters at efficiency, basically reducing variation, standardizing processes, and moving forward. Uh, Alfred Sloan, the, uh, the CEO of General Motors, later said, if the system works well, management could go away. All in intelligence is in the system. The processes, the standards we put in place, this works, right? That worked great. And then uh, this uh, nice gentleman came along, Peter Drucker, an Austrian who, who later lived in California and was considered the father of modern management. He already said in the 70s or, already, we see a change in the way uh, work is done in the world, the rise of the knowledge worker. We see that we work with individuals that are really skilled in their, their uh, sphere, and management needs to deal with people that know more than management does. Maybe you have been in some of those situations, you can attest to that, that that's an interesting dynamic. And he said, we need to work differently in a knowledge economy. Management has to be more an orchestrator um, of, of the organization. So that all worked really, really well. It gave rise to uh, companies that priced it high, highly, Apple in the early days, you know, without Steve Jobs or John, Jonathan Ive, uh, probably wouldn't have hate, had the success it had. Um, but now we see over the last uh, while that we're shifting to a different way that organizations need to work, which um, we call network of brains. Uh, basically, work gets accomplished across different organizations. So it's not just your organization or your team, but you need to work across with different constituencies in order to get work done. You are much less driven by hierarchy, you're much more driven by whoever has the knowledge and how that assembles together. So it's much more around platform economics in order to gain competitive advantage. The big valuation of companies these days is all around building a platform and getting different people onto that platform. So it's a completely different skill set. If you can't control people and tell them, if you don't do this, you don't get your bonus, you have to uh, completely work differently. So it's much more around this whole drive for agile, which is, which is a result of the uh, dramatic markets. And the question that a lot of organizations have is, we are expert at this, we're super production, we're efficiency machines, we execute like crazy, but now the market changes and it takes us 36 months to have a pilot project done. That's bad news, right? So everybody's getting nervous and they say, we need to get faster, we need to get more ownership to the people, we can't wait for senior management to be the bottleneck and to be clocked. We need to learn to work on this way of a collaboration and, and a team setting. And um, you see some of the companies that do that, um, GitHub, um, uh, a lot of you techies uh, obviously know that. So um, we are at a historic accumulation of innovation power. These are innovation platforms through the years. Each platform triggers a whole new set of industries. So it's not just the innovation itself, but it, what it enables. The steam engine about 1800, 
changed the world. Uh, railways changed the world. It took a while, but then around the turn of the century, we had three innovation platforms at once. Then it took a while till computers came along, internet, and at the moment we see five innovation platforms all happening at the same time. As always, we don't know how they play out, but amongst others, artificial intelligence will dramatically change the world. Somebody recently said the next thousand uh, successful startups will be basically business model X plus AI. Right? AI will have a dramatic effect on any industry, no matter where you work, and there's a lot of others, so there's enormous economic potential. But whoever was successful yesterday will not be successful tomorrow. We see that with the big car manufacturers, we see that with big industries that we build around. Uh, it's, it's a time of unprecedented change. And this is the challenge in leadership. Um, People have learned and have risen to the top through, through decades of grinding in a system, and now the world is changing, and the, the, the natural reflex is just to fall back on what you know really, really well. So the greatest danger in, in times of disruption is not the disruption, but it's the behavior that made you successful yesterday that doesn't carry you forward to tomorrow. So that's a big challenge we see in organizations. Organizations speak really well this, this uh, language of hierarchy, of control, uh, of uh, rewards and punishment, but the language of culture, of purpose, of joint collaboration around something that's uh, inspiring to people uh, almost feels like me trying to speak French. This is a movie which you now have to skip uh, just as a Interest, if you want to see this play out, there's a, there's a documentary in German called Die Stille Revolution. And it's a bit longish, it's a documentary, but it's, it's interesting because it highlights through interviews and different things this fact how leadership changes and how organization changes. And two quotes from, from, from also the trailer is one of the organizational managers says, we, we are really, really good at know-how, but we have forgotten the know-why. In, in a lot of organizations. So the purpose, the motivational basis. And Wolf Lotter, who is the, the chief um, um, editor of Brand 1, uh, says basically the, the shift we're witnessing right now is as significant as the shift from an ar ar agrarian culture to an industrial culture. So the shift we're witnessing now in terms of leadership and organizational behavior is as massive as from an agrarian society to an industrial society, which, which was huge and changed a lot. I think we're in the middle of this huge change. The world is shifting. Um, you know, you have the org chart of the US military, classical hierarchy, command and control. And uh, on, on the right side, you have Al-Qaeda. And uh, despite the US military having a much larger budget, being probably much better educated, having more resources, they were not able to address um, this other organization. Why? Because they fought against the network and not a centralized command. The US military was very good in facing other militaries, where you have bridges to bomb and central commands to bomb, and then you take out the infrastructure, and then you you know, you take over whatever you need to do. There you had, had a system that was distributed and informal and, and very much agile in its way. And uh, despite all these resources and a very public, uh, a global public watching eye, they weren't able to, to sort of um, make their way with them. You see at the bottom the, the new power movement, the largest hotel chain previously and the largest hotel chain now. Uh, this is all well known, but behind that is really a shift in the way power is used in organization. Um, there's a business book called uh, New Power, which uh, you know also contrasts these. Uh, previously, the largest knowledge base in the world was this esteemed um, library of books. Maybe some of your grandparents have, have them in, in their bookshelves. It's really, really long, and there's an authority on each little piece. Right? And about uh, um, 2001, this internet platform comes along, which basically proposes, forget about the big books, we just open it up and everybody can contribute. And grandparents say, well, what if what is in there is not correct? And uh, when my kids, when our teenagers went to school and they tried to look stuff up through Wikipedia, the, the older people always said, oh, but it's not a reliable source. 
It has become a reliable source. It's much faster. So if there's a soccer game and somebody scores, within two minutes it's updated on Wikipedia. So uh, it takes uh, the esteemed magazine quite long and uh, it has gone out of print in 2010. So any business will lose against any platform business if it's uh, executed well. It's a shift in power. On the old power, it was centralized, it was checked, it was guarded, not everybody could write in it, and expertise and rank was really important. So there was lots of professors writing this, lots of people who studied their subject really well, and that gave it credibility. Here, it's the mass of people, self-censorship, and coordination through the network. Um, this book, uh, New Power, details some of this, this shift. Um, the old power is, is very institutional, it's all around exclusive real resource consolidation around a central place in an organization. They get to decide what to use. They're usually very confidential, so usually budgets in a comp company are not widely shared. Decision protocols are not widely shared. Minutes are very carefully selected, what is getting out, what not. Uh, expertise and professionalism and specialization gets you up there. Um, you know, I, in HR I get CVs and everybody tries to put out their, their best gear and, and showing their expertise and that's how people used to get hired. And they demand long-term loyalty and um, that's all good and a lot of stuff gets accomplished through old power, but there's a new power rising through more informal network that's collaboration based, that's open, that's all in and you know transparent. Um, anybody who shows initiative can do that and uh, move things forward. But it's also a little bit more short-lived. So Occupy Wall Street obviously isn't isn't that big a thing anymore. Um, and and so it has some downsides. But there's a real shift in the world. So when companies think about how to become more agile, how to become more um, flexible, they're really talking about how we, do we distribute power differently, how do we decide differently, how do we allow different inputs in our business to make, make a change. So values are shifting, times are shifting, and um, this young gentleman said, when the future comes in around the corner, always lean in. So when things are inevitable, even if you don't like them, the best thing is to deal with them to take them head on and to find a way to make the best out of it. So I think, for example, in Germany, our sometimes skeptical thing about uh, certain technologies or whatever is a dangerous thing to do. Actually, uh, we work with a, a larger insurance company that's quite conservative, controlled. They want to have a risk-free world. You know, they, they, they don't experiment too much. But they started working with us. We did some bar cams. We did uh, other things to loosen them up a little bit. And then I found out the first autonomous driving car in Germany is run by this old insurance when the future comes around the corner, lean in. They understood autonomous car, driving cars will be a reality and one of the biggest problems will be insurance. Why don't we experiment with it? We bring a uh, car on the street, we learn our lessons, then we learn the downsides and all of those things, but we lean in, we make the best out of it. So our attitude matters. So this is one thing uh, we, we find in, in uh, organizations. My own function, which was human resources, has introduced about 10, 15 years ago this concept of business partner. And I find in large corporations, you quite often have this drive to business partnership. Finance has that, law has that, procurement has that. So all functions that need to support somebody, they introduce this language of let's be, you know, almost like internal partners. Some other companies talk about entrepreneurship, trying to, to uh, facilitate um, more um, initiative and ownership with, within their ranks. So uh, we looked at it and we thought, how can we support this? So collaboration in the network, we came up with these seven things. Um, if that's of interest to you, that might be helpful, sort of an assessment to drive that. My message today is, we're really living in shifting times. It's not superficial. I think behind the trend, there's a bigger trend that's to notice. So behind the trend of agile and all those sort of um, ideas, there's a trend in how work gets done today, and it's really the trend to collaboration and working in, in teams. There's a tools aspect to it, but there's also a whole business philosophy aspect behind it, where I think businesses will have to work through in order to make the most out of these shifting times.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marlin, for that very inspiring talk. Are there any questions for Marlin? There is one. A uh, couple of slides before which uh, you spoke about old values and new yeah. values. If someone has started their career like 30 years before, they are really born with the old value yeah. and they have been successful with the old value and it is the only value which they know. Yeah. So if somebody started a career like five years before, they would start with new value and they wouldn't find any difference at all. Shouldn't we have something in the middle? Because the, this slide, if I am like um, old enough, I'm 50 plus, it kind of invalidates what I have born and brought up and grown mm. with. How do you target all those people who are 50 plus and who still don't know if the new value will work, but they definitely know so far it's only the old value which has gotten, gotten them there? Yeah. How would you, uh, how would you tran transition them? Um, there was a lot of questions in there, in that one question, so should there be a middle way? Uh, probably, I mean, it's, it's as many books, it's, it uh, polarizes in order to make a point and that the world is shifting. Um, I think some of the values that we have in old power are actually quite good, like commitment, clarity, you know, some, some strategic tools and so forth. So I think actually it's quite good that people have a solid base, that they learn the business, because sometimes if people are, I notice with millennials and working networks, it can become quite quite high on ambition and low on results sometimes. Um, however, changing people, I think um, it's hard. Especially if you were successful, you will always fall back to what you know. But if people are really interested, I think there, there is a way. And um, you know, uh, people who were successful in that certainly always have an understanding of what happen is happening around them. So I think understanding the world, why it's changing, I think, um, there's certainly a way of, of getting there. The, the, old, I mean, the older one gets, the, easy, the, the less easy it is to, to learn and to, to adjust uh, very ingrained ways. But I'm, I'm hopeful, uh, because I've seen it, uh, that you know, if people lean in and they say, I want this, there's quite, there's quite a way to learn. Do you think this resistance is specifically a lot in Germany? Yeah. <laughs> We, we like rules, we like standards, you know, we like how things were, so it's, it's not the easiest cultural climate. So one of the big things in this area is letting go of control, which is not a German virtue, and uh, dealing with mistakes, which in most German com companies is a huge problem. Most are fear-driven, or there's an element of fear in a lot of uh, companies that, for example, my experience with the US, it's much less, or it's in a different, it's more, it's more forgiving, it's more accommodating um, about people processes. Here in Germany, you get a t tattoo if you fail, and then you carry it with you. Are there any more questions? That doesn't look to be the case. So thank you very much again, Marlin. You're welcome. <laughs>